to uh, host our um, next guest lecture uh, from um, a master's student, um, Chen Yang, who's uh, done a remarkable variety of work with us um, with multi-scale modeling of diabetes and pregnancy uh, using hidden Markov models particle filtering for mosquito populations with models of e-cigarette and cigarette use for, uh, for uh, understanding uh, the uh, growing use of e-cigarettes, particularly um, amongst the younger population. And um, in this class, in this uh, situation, um, building hidden Markov models for classifying uh, uh, the occurrence of smoking patterns. Um, amongst individuals carrying smartphones. Um, before Chen Yang goes on, I, I did want to make uh, one note. Um, this is related to a question Lavi asked me very helpfully during the break. Um, Lavi had referred to a slide, which I briefly flashed through, which commented on the fact that for the last uh, case study, we had used actually two approaches. I focused on the hidden Markov model approach, but in the interest of time, I didn't dwell on this slide, which noted we had also performed classification with another important and fairly prevalent machine learning method called naive Bayes. Okay? Naive Bayes classifiers, a particularly simple form of using Bayesian reasoning to classify different cases of a, um, a, based on features of, of different particular occurrences here of, of classifications within a given interval of time. So the idea is we use naive Bayes method to classify for each little time slot, each little time step, um, what state a person was in based on the observations received. And naive Bayes did so based on the vector, the, the set of observations for that time slot in isolation. So the idea was it was used to judge based on the accelerometry, the gyroscope readings, etc. For that particular slice of time alone, what was their state sitting, standing, lying, uh, sitting, standing, um, uh, off person versus walking at that time slot, not take into account the neighboring time slots. Hmm? And we did so for each and every time slot um, as an alternative to hidden markup models. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention at several points in the talk, I wanted to mention it, but I didn't have the information available to me to double check my memory, is the length of those time slots. Hidden Markov models were used in that case to classify every second. For every second, we classified whether they were sitting, standing, walking, or um, or indeed engaged in, um, uh, engaged with the phone off person. Um, so for every second, we use that hidden markup model. And what that took into account, which is germane to Chin Yan's presentation here, is the temporal regularity. So if you think about naive base, analyzing every time slot independently, not taking into account uh, neighboring time slot considerations, and you consider hidden Markov models, what's the real difference? Both are Bayesian approaches. By both, both are using probability distributions according to Bayesian principles. The real difference with hidden Markov models is that it's taken into account temporal sequencing and the underlying theory of how frequently people change posture or activity. So if you're classifying every second, I'm known as a dynamic lecturer, and indeed I've received awards for, uh, for example, the most steps walked per lecture um, across <laughs> campus. Um, I've even been known to run from one side of a stage to another to make a pedagogic point um, in front of some of the people assembled with us today. Um, but even I do not tend to switch postures you know, it, uh, too frequently in neighboring seconds. You know, I'm not sitting down, some, you, know, uh, you know, walking around and lying down and, and putting my phone off person every second. Um, there's a certain temporal regularity to my movements, as much as you might think otherwise. Um, and by dividing up time into one second intervals, what we were giving 
the hidden Markov model was the opportunity to take into account the kind of regularities associated with motion, with, with changing posture and changing activity. That typically, look, if you've been in a sitting state for the past two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, the chance that you'll remain in that sitting state over the next second is pretty high. If you've been walking for the past five seconds, the chance you'll continue to walk is pretty high on a per second basis. If you have had the phone off person for a couple seconds, even though you might be checking it a lot, the chance you'll check in the next second is comparatively small. So there's a lot of regularities by which information from the past second can, and what, if you are very confident that they uh, were standing in the past second, the chance that they'll be standing in the next second, again, is pretty, pretty high, okay? Um, it's not to say there's no motion. Of course there's motion. Of course people switch from standing to sitting. But they're unlikely to be switching every second. And so we can put in place this transition matrix that will capture a lot of that underlying theory that people stay standing, stay sitting, stay walking, and phone stays off person typically for a while, for, for many seconds, maybe many minutes in some cases. And the hidden Markov model took that into account with its transition matrix. Um, and in many hidden Markov models we train, we find through maximal likelihood methods the transition matrix that's most appropriate and it takes into account that regularity. And it ends up factoring into a big way in those calculations we saw about what state we're in now. Do we take into account the new observation? Absolutely, the new observation vector. We, we use that information, but if we, in the last time step, or if we're looking retrospectively the next time step, we're very sure where we were, that will influence our judgment in this time step as well. We might say, oh, that measurement's a fluke, right? It's, it, sure, it, it made us look like we were walking, but maybe we're just sitting you know, rotating around quickly because we're getting the phone. And, and we can deal with small departures from our expectations through this regularization that comes from nearby data points, the context. Naive Bayes doesn't take into account that context when applied in each in isolation. So it was trying to judge for this second, what was I doing using only the information from that second. Regardless of whether last you know, last and next time step, I'm clearly walking. If I saw a low, a low acceleration measurement, it would say, you are sitting, quite possibly. And that's a harder task. And so when we looked at Naive Base and we saw the difference in performance, in many ways we attributed it to the presence of a temporal model underlying hidden Markov models, which is absent for Naive Bayes. And it's a general point about the mixture of data science and system science jointly that we can combine knowledge of the regularities of the world as captured by a system science model. Knowledge of processes in the world or, or theory about processes in the world. And we can bring that as a, as a, a bit of knowledge to bear when interpreting the data and interpret the data more reliably with less you know, um, frenetic misinterpretations of the data that are implausible given context or knowledge of the regularities of the world. And in many ways, that's what this boot camp is about. Techniques like hidden Markov models, like particle filtering, like particle MCMC, bring an understanding of regularities in the world to bear on interpreting rich data and allow us to interpret it more judiciously and, and interpret it more deeply, okay? So that's just a comment on the last, uh, the last example, which will hold as well for Chin Yang's example, because with Chin Yang's example as well, people don't start and stop smoking once a second. They don't light up and snuff it out, and light up and snuff it out. They will typically smoke for a certain period of time, maybe the length of a cigarette. Right? Um, and her model can take into account those regularities um, when interpreting data. So it's a big part of hidden markup model. Levy. So then uh, with hidden markup model, we can actually calculate the rate of change of the overall model then? Uh, yes, yes. So, so, 
Yeah. Sorry? But we cannot do that with magnitude. Yeah, with value phase, you're looking, you know, each each vector for each time is considered in solitude there. And it's not to say that naive phase is a bad method. It's just it's not a it's not a method to take into account temporal context. And hidden Markov model is probably its closest analog that takes into account um, uh, temporal context and temporal sequencing. Also a Bayesian method. It can't both can be captured with Bayes networks in fruitful ways um, and captured with uh, tools uh, that are used for, for viewing Bayes networks. But, um, uh, but they're, they're, um, they use different, <coughs> different models and uh, hidden Markov models use models of temporal sequencing. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Okay, um, so it's now with great pleasure that um, I, uh, I switch over to uh, Chen Yang. I am 